Okay. Says we're going live. Hello, everyone. This is Interplay Big Body Stories live streamed. My name is Phil Porter. I'm one of the co directors, co founders of Interplay. If you're new to Interplay, Interplay is an active, creative way to unlock oh the wisdom of the body. So um, one of the things we play around with are stories um, and telling stories, telling our own stories. And a big body story is a story that can include um, words, movement, and sound or singing. Um, that It's kind of as simple as that. So they come out in a lot of different ways, but all the stories we're going to be telling today are improvised. So we're going to be going, each one of us will be telling a story. We each have five minutes. Uh, Randy rings a bell for us if we um, start to go over. Um, which is the way we do it in the big body story classes. We've been teaching these classes, uh, Randy and I, for um, since the uh, since just after the pandemic started. So actually, we've done like 200 classes over the last uh, almost three years. Um, and just starting last October, we've been experimenting with doing some live streams. So that's what we're doing again today. And we're also doing one on February 16th. And is it March 2nd? Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's see, if you are, uh, well, here's what we do. When we're done with the story, then those of us in the group um, just put some really quick noticings, just maybe a word or a phrase into the chat box in, um, in, in Zoom. If you are um, signed up for the YouTube channel, the Big Body Stories channel, you would have access to the chat box on YouTube. And if you want to do a word or a phrase about the story that you just heard, you can do that. And then after each story, we'll share what we've written. We'll read those out. And we'll also have Mary Ellen read anything that's put on the YouTube. Um, and those of you who are watching live stream now, if you want to put in your name, even just your first name, and where you're located, um, you don't have to. But if you'd like to, uh, it's always fun sometimes to know who's, who's there. Um, but the, so the process will be that each of us will tell a story. We'll do just a little bit of noticing in the chat box. You can do that as well. Uh, we'll read those out and then we'll go on to the next person. So I think that was everything. Anything else I should say, Wendy? Oh, just that there's a tiny time lag between what we're doing and what you're seeing on YouTube. So if anything feels a little funny or laggy, well, that's just the way the technology is. <laughs> yeah. All right, so everybody take a deep breath and let it out. Let's give your body a little shake. And I'm going to go first. So here we go. Are we going to are we going to do introductions first? Oh, we should do that. Um, I introduce myself and we'll we'll just introduce ourselves in the order that we're going. So Mary, Mary Ellen, you're next. I'm Mary Ellen May and I am on the uh, Kikapoi um, Miami land, now known as Bloomington, Indiana. Hi everyone, I'm Karen Hatch, a she, her pronouns, and I live on Powhatan lands, which are now, um, which is land now known as Virginia. I'm Randy Newswanger, living in Pennsylvania on lands of the Conestoga and the Susquehannock. Hi, my name's Karen. I am zooming in from Australia, the great southern land. And I'm Ruba, and I'm on, um, it's out of my head. Well, I'm in Oregon. I'll probably tell you what land I'm on when I get back on again. It starts with a K. Kalapuya, Kalapuya, Kalapuya. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Okay, here we go. Uh, This morning, the back gate wouldn't close. It's a metal gate, 
And over the past few days, we've had a lot of rain. I don't know if it has anything to do with the rain here in California, but the, the date had been sticking. But this morning we were going out, we went out and I tried to close the door and it wouldn't close which is a challenge because, you know, it's one of the accesses into the building. And so it messes with security when we can't close the gate. And so my partner, Chin, who is, he has, he has a secret engineering part of his brain that I don't completely understand. And so he said he would rig up the, the door so it, we could keep it closed. So we didn't have to worry about people coming in and out. So I, I, I completely trusted that he would be able to do this, but I could not have imagined how he did it. It involved those zip ties, you know, a little black zip tie. It involved the top part of a corkscrew, the kind that has the little, you know, shape like that. And then it's got two prong things that to cut off the prongs so we'd have the loop and an S hook and some rope and he had tied it to the door and to a, oh, a pole, and he had put a piece of bamboo in the rope and he had twisted the bamboo right up next to the building so it couldn't untwist. <laughs> Who thinks like that? <laughs> but to tell the truth, I have been doing some engineering too, because it's been raining like crazy. And because a part of our building in the back is leaking, I had to figure out a way to get the water to go off the back of the building rather than just to puddle on the roof and then, and then drip down into our laundry room. I discovered this problem. I discovered this problem on, on New Year's Eve day. I was about to start an interplay event. I was just about to go online. I went downstairs and I found all this water. Oh my God. And it was starting to sleep, steep into other, sleep, so a slip, slip, shrip, into other parts of the building, you know, the, the, the basement. Ah. So I actually, I actually spent part of my day, even, even around the teaching, like Cynthia would teach, I would run down and I would sweep out some of the, some of the water and I'd sweep it out the back door and then sweep out some more and I'd sweep out some more. And it was coming down, it was coming down a lot of, it was, it was one of the parts of where the water was really, was really raining a lot, was raining a lot. So after that day, I thought, oh, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, so, so I'm looking out the back, I'm looking, I keep looking out in this direction because that's where it all is. <clears throat> So there's one tarp that goes this way, and there's another tarp that goes this way, and then another tarp that goes this way, and then there's another tarp that goes, and all of those tarps take the water someplace else. Don't tell anyone, but a lot of it is going out to the Taco Bell parking lot, which is right behind us. I don't know how they feel about that. I sort of feel like we should take responsibility for all of our water, but you know, it didn't seem to be a problem. It seemed to know where to go. When it got to the Taco Bell parking lot, it seemed to know where to go and it wasn't back into our building. I am so grateful for that. So I guess, you know, Chin and I both, who neither one of us is an engineer, but we have had to use that part of our That creative mechanical someone wanna pronounce you put to solve everyday, well, not everyday problems, once once in every once in a while problems. Take a deep breath and let it out. No. And if um, folks, if you want to put some notes in the chat box, and if you're watching on YouTube and you're signed into the channel or you're, yeah, if you're signed into the channel, you can put stuff in the chat box as well. And I'll read these, I'll read the ones that are in the chat box on our end. 
Jazzy resourcefulness. Necessity, the mother of invention, utilized by two men, a man in his tarp and a man in his bamboo can, can do anything. Chin and Phil, the mad scientist engineers. Engineering, floods, solving problems left and right. And Mary Ellen, do we have anything on the other end? Yes, um, Shelly and Elizabeth in Durham, North Carolina, let's say your partner Chin and a little Dutch boy. That's who thinks that way, my friend. Love <laughs> how you and your stories flow. And uh, I wrote, I had no idea that was all happening while you were teaching class on New Year's Day. <laughs> wow, <laughs> creative voice. And there's one more here. Now everyone knows you put the water in Taco Bell. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. So everybody take a deep breath. And let it out. And Mary Ellen, you're up. Sometime last week, I went to the mailbox and pulled out the stuff and there was a letter for me. And it was from someone I didn't know. And I was kind of tickled because I never get letters unless it's, you know, Christmas cards or whatever. This was after Christmas and it wasn't someone I knew. And I was like, this mysterious letter is so curious. So I went inside and opened it and it was from Fran Lee. And I don't know who she was, but she said that she is a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> and she asked me if I knew why bad things happen to good people. And I thought, <laughs> not again, not again. This is this. I've received several letters from Jehovah's Witness. I don't know how they found out about me. <laughs> I don't know who told them <laughs> I'm a non-believer, but they got a hold of my address and they write to me every so often. <laughs> and the letter went on to explain that bad things happen to good people because of Satan. <laughs> and quoted a few Bible verses about God and Satan and good and evil, and then shared a website with me if I wanted to learn more. And it was a safe website and they wouldn't take my personal information or anything like that. And she I, it was so endearing because she hand wrote it in cursive. And it was a little scribbly, like maybe she's a little older, I don't know. I don't want to assume, but that's what I that's what I would assume if I made an assumption. And I was kind of tickled because there was a little pamphlet too. And the pamphlet is like, I wish I had saved it, but my family was disturbed and they made me recycle it. They were, <laughs> I wanted to keep it around, but they said, this is just, you need to get rid of this out of our house, get out of our house. But I, the, the pamphlet had a big white man with white hair in the clouds, looking down on these other white people and this other white man in front of a cross and he was preaching. And then it had like some words and the words were pretty simple and basic and you know, just that, that sort of stuff. And I, I really wanted to write her back. But again, I was dissuaded. My husband said, don't, don't do that. Don't waste your time <laughs> writing back. That's silly. So I didn't. But if I had written her back, maybe I would have said something like, dear Fran, <laughs> thank you for your letter. <laughs> Thanks for your concern. I'm good. <laughs> How are you? 
Um, you know, bad things happen to bad things and people and things and good and things and people and bad and good and it just all happens. And I would love to know, you know, why, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it doesn't have anything to do with Satan. And I also kind of just wonder if Satan is not just like code for, for really evil things. Like maybe it's just poetry from another time because when, you know, that book was composed, they didn't really understand a lot about the world and they thought that the world was flat and that the sun and planets revolved around the earth. And now we know a lot more and we're all just one big cosmos and there's no up there or down there. It's just all one. And so, you know, we just kind of have to translate sometimes and, and see what it means today. And if I were to say what Satan is today, it's hatred and racism and white supremacy. So, Fran, you can put down your pen. <laughs> I do not need to be saved. I'm good, and you're good, and I love you. And let's go, let's go fight injustice together. And take a deep breath. And let it out. <sighs> and we'll put some notes in the chat box. Okay. Karen said, so glorious, making a new friend in Fran. And yes, put down the pen, R.E. Satan. It is so time. Randy, thank you. I love you. Let's go fight injustice together. That's fantastic wisdom. Bill, you are saved, but it sounds like the letter wasn't. <laughs> Good, evil, and a friendly conversation. Karen, I love your response to Fran. Ruba, going out on the bridge to meet beyond good and bad, listening to Fran's heart. Oh, Karen, I love that your family loved this cycle. <laughs> and in the YouTube chat, Elizabeth says, I'm with her on all fronts. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, BJ said, Fran must have friends across the ocean as they too are sending me handwritten letters. <laughs> Thank you. Let's get, take another deep breath. Uh, let it out. Uh, Thank you, Mary Ellen. And Karen, that's Karen, the first Karen. What an opportunity. My video could go viral. <laughs> so I wanted to really pick out something to talk about that's really important. And so tonight, I want to talk about wonder, awe, and how I am so in all of life. One time I said to this lady, ma'am, what do you think the most important discovery in the whole world has been? And I thought she might say antibiotics or a man on the moon. She was a farmer's wife and she said, air conditioned tractors. <laughs> wow, I'm in awe. Another time 
there was this little boy and he was one of the kids on this big fancy bus that was going to a historically black university. And then on the way home, this question was posed, what, what was the most amazing thing about the day? All this fine art that was seen at Hampton University and the Native American children and the Black children that were buried in the church cemetery. And he said, a bathroom on a bus. <laughs> <laughs> on a bus I am in awe and you know what and think about that child in your family that little toddler that just loves to dance that discovers the dance and then wants to show you the dance and they got the little moves going on everybody has a little kid like that in their family i love that oh i love that so much i love how you can transmit so much love through your eyeball <laughs> I love that. I love how much beauty, how we can create so much beauty. And so much pain and destruction. That is awesome, too. We are so amazing. Just looking at a leaf or a hand or the way the sculpy clay colors run together when you smash them. So much the way sounds resonate together. And the way my half smile can make me feel like I'm the ocean wave. Like I really am the ocean wave. And that little kid who dances. <laughs> I finished early, that's amazing. <laughs> And take a deep breath and let it out. <sighs> and we'll put some notes in the chat box. Do you want to read, read yours, Karen? That was so much fun to do. Um, <laughs> Aaron Austin says, the image is conjured of so many people across, across the world in awe, especially the little one dancing. And Ruba says, yes, awesome awesomeness, transmitting love through our eyeballs. Uh, and Randy says, such amazing richness in the world, if I stop to ask about it. And Mary Ellen says, I could feel your exuberance, so much awe in your voice. And Phil says, awe. <laughs> what a delightful story, so much joy. Thank you, everyone. YouTube, I said, I hope this video goes viral too. <laughs> Elizabeth said,
Karen, your exuberance makes me not able to stop smiling. Oh, thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you, Karen. And Randy, you're up. Ah, when I was 11 years old, when I was 11 years old, my favorite apple, my favorite apple was a red delicious. It, it wasn't just, just my favorite apple, it was my favorite fruit. Because peaches have that, that fuzzy skin that if you get it in your mouth and they're so if you peel it instead of eating it with the skin on and then the juice gets all over you it's sticky i i do not i do not like stickiness and and oranges are a lot of work and apples apples are just so straightforward and easy but my favorite kind of apple was a red delicious so much so that i took some apple seeds from a red delicious apple and i put them in the ground and then Two years later, we moved from Pennsylvania to Indiana, and I took that little apple tree seedling and I put it in a styrofoam cup and I moved it to Indiana and I planted it in the backyard and maybe it's still there. But it's, it's not easy to get to because now it's in somebody else's backyard. It's not easy to get to. There, there, are, there are some places I've been that I've experienced that it would be fun to experience again that are easy, easy to get back to. And there are some that it's just, it's just, just not possible. Like maybe, maybe if you live somewhere where there are fresh strawberries, you've had a fresh strawberry pie and then you can imagine like how good a fresh strawberry pie is and imagine if you lived somewhere like three months i was in costa rica when i was in college somewhere where the pineapples grow fresh and when you pick them it's like the difference between a really fresh fruit and the one that's been sitting there. fresh pineapple pie like a fresh strawberry pie i don't know when i'll get that again <sighs> and if you've ever been in a potato chip factory or made your own potato <laughs> chips and just got them right fresh out of the oil that's a completely different ball game and almost nobody gets a chance to go to the marshmallow factory and get a marshmallow that's fresh it's not really fresh off the presses. It's fresh off of the industrial complex marshmallow manufactory, which doesn't sound that great, but you know, it's sugar. So, but, but the difference between a marshmallow that's fresh off the presses and one that's been in the bag in the grocery store surrounded by stale air and plastic for a while is just, they're just worlds, worlds apart. Oh, I thought I was going to tell a nature story because it started <laughs> with apple seeds and apple trees. Oh, I have a I have a couple of apple trees in my backyard in in Lancaster City now. I've got I've got a Macintosh and a Red Delicious. No, I don't have a Red Delicious. That was when I was eleven. It's no longer my favorite apple because times change. You know, even if I wanted to eat a Red Delicious, I couldn't have the same experience now as when I was 11 because I have had so many other great apples and they're making new great ones. Oh, Honey Crisp and Cosmic Crisp and I had a twist something or other and they're just all over the place with apples. Oh, maybe, maybe, you know, I was so surprised that one time when I saw that they had toasted marshmallows in the bag. Like they're pre-toasted and they're coated with, they're coated with coconut, which isn't one of my favorites, but, but, but it's just like change just seems to be happening all the time. And now, now in my fifties, there's something about nostalgia. I watched, I watched a semi-trailer truck in the city of Philadelphia backing up a whole block to turn around and 
load out of the stuff in the Kimmel Center. And I watched at this Pennsylvania farm show some tractors and some drivers trying to back up wagons. And and they're just 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 priceless priceless things you can witness. I thought I thought with the semi trailer of my my grandfather and my great uncle who were truck drivers, I can imagine them backing up their big truck in the city. It's, it was it was fun to watch, but it's not it's not something I want to do too much too much chaos. You'll just have to figure out what that story was about because I have no idea. But you can eat an apple. You can eat an apple later. And take a deep breath. And let it out. Oh. And we'll put some notes in the chat box. So here are some of the comments. Randy Appleseed making his own apples, making his own life through nostalgia and body wisdom choices. Fresh versus plastic manufactured. Your story makes me think of cellular agriculture. Things change. So glad to get both apples and marshmallows and fresh ones to boot. Oh, Randy, maybe maybe Google Earth would show you if there's a huge apple tree in your old backyard, and I got to find the closest potato chip factory. So many delicious kinds of apples. This might be worth a trip to Goshen and to Costa Rica pineapples. Definitely worth a trip back. <laughs> and on YouTube, um... Shelly and Elizabeth say, potato chip pies, how American. Maybe, <laughs> maybe even more than apple pie. What do I know? I'm a damn foreigner. Honey crisps? Did anyone say honey crisps? Next time <laughs> in your North, you're in North Carolina, we will fry some honey crisps. Chaos and fluffy marshmallows, says Elizabeth. That's what this story is about. <laughs> good. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. Okay, the other Karen. The other Karen. Maybe there's only one Karen. Or maybe we are taking over the world because... we might have something to say. And I have something to say about... Body wisdom today, like body wisdom, it is in August, I think it was about the 20th or 21st of August, something happened. Something happened in my own house. And now in Australia on the 17th of January, it caught up with me. Like it, it like I woke up this morning and the thing that happened on the 20th or the 21st of August caught up with me on the 17th of January. Now, on a level of observation, I can go, wow, wow, look how fast and far I ran over that five-month period, little less, couple of days, minutes, hours here or there, seconds. And yet it turns up in this, like, this dynamic 
opposition where you know those moments when you just want a good night's sleep like you go to bed you've done everything right and you're snuggled up and even though it's summer here we still get a little blanket I love a little blanket but you're doing everything right 1 25 a.m like 1 25 a.m 1 25 freaking a.m you're awake for hours like hours two days in a row and you know that's liver time and you know the liver plays with you because it wants to live like the body this awe-inspiring machine like have you ever like with an Australian accent or or it could be the row, row, row your boat, or or it could be, <laughs> or, or it could be this or that. Like you never can tell with an Australian or, and I am one of those ones that have done the row, row, row your boat up freaking stream for most of my life. So it's no wonder that it took five months, a little less, a few days and hours and seconds for this moment of 1.25 a.m. through 4.35 a.m. to say, Karen, you have been running away, but there is no place to hide. There is no place to hide and that moment and it only lasted a few seconds on the 20th or the 21st of August has now arrived has now arrived for you to deal with it was a green apple for me a green Granny Smith apple. And in our family, on our apples and oranges, we put salt. We put salt on our apples and oranges. And it was this green apple. And you could tell, and I'm fussy. I know I'm fussy. I'm fussy about my fruit. It has to, it has to smell like it's alive. And it has to be this shiny green. And when I rub it, I can see myself in the reflection. And when I cut it, there's this whiteness inside and I can sprinkle salt. Because it's this sour, this salty, this sweetness that brings life to life, that brings awe to my world. The awe of apples or oranges. And this five months, a little less in three weeks or hours or minutes or seconds tells me that I need to put the oars down. The ones that are taking me upstream, the ones that are taking me away from that moment to moment synchronization of the somatic and the spiritual. And that event that happened August 20th or 21st in winter, deep winter here in Australia, is now being spotlighted. And this dynamic opposition of sadness and anger and sadness and anger and how And how, and how it can be witnessed through movement and story and a little song. Thank you. And take a deep breath and let it out. Yeah. And we'll put some notes in the chat box.
Ruba writes, listening to liver wisdom, savoring dynamic opposition, the salty and the sweet. Mm. Randy writes, time and events catching up in the middle of the night, beautiful weaving of experience. Bill says, catching up with the body or the body catching up with us. Deep wisdom to come. Mary Ellen says, so many beautiful elements play together. So many beautiful elements play with together. Loved this story. And Karen, a beautiful telling, the salty and the sweet, non-duality. So much, so much to unpack when you're just catching up. Thank you. And from YouTube, Elizabeth says, ah, as an A-W-E in all caps. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Thank you. OK, Ruba. Mm. Getting all the Zoom signs off my screen. There you are. Ooh. Oh, I could go. I could go days, even as an interplayer, without swirling and whirling and moving in all of these different points of the compass and the up and the down, and it feels very good. My two brothers and I are less than three years apart in age. So between December 24th every year and May 1st every year, we are in stair steps age-wise. So some years we were two, three, and four years old during that time of the year. And some years we were 28, 29, and 30. I'm the oldest, by the way. I don't know if you can tell. And now we are 60, 61, and 62 until my birthday, May 1st. Oh my gosh, how did we get to be in our 60s? My little brother's in me. I remember when I was six years old, I got a bike and it had training wheels. And I was excited and I didn't know how to ride it. And I remember standing on the front porch of our house and suddenly from behind me on the driveway, my little brother, my little brother who was four, rode my bike without the training wheels down the driveway and out into the street. And I just remember that bafflement. But, 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 but he's four. How can he do anything that I can't do? He's not supposed to be able to do anything that I can't do. I'm six. He's four. Oh. That was, that was an astonishing a moment. Well, these are the these are the years. These are the years going by. All of the years. Oops, the decades going by. He's still younger than me, and our other brother is even younger than that. But I am going on a nine nine day nine day silent retreat in March because my little brother went on a five-day silent retreat this fall and boy he came back talking about his experience and that then he and his son my nephew were going on a nine-day retreat in March and I just didn't even think about it I probably should have and I said, oh, I want to go. I want to go. And, and within 10 minutes, I not only had signed up, but I had paid the full fee, which I didn't have to pay for, you know, a month or so. But I got myself into it. So I'm going. 
nine days. And I and I'm pretty I'm pretty nervous. I'm pretty nervous about it. But if my little brother can do it, well, he hasn't done nine days yet, but oh, so I'm going, I'm gonna go. Well, here's the thing. I'm a Quaker. <laughs> I'm a Quaker. I've been a Quaker for coming up on 13 years. So why would nine days of a silent retreat, you know, freak me out? Well, because I really, I really like verbal stuff. <laughs> I like talking. I like talking to people when I'm with people. I, lo- I like the things that are in my head. I like seeing you. <laughs> Don't think that at this retreat that would be a good thing to just sing fake opera in the middle of the nine days of silence. Maybe there'll be a place I can walk out into the trees or something at this retreat center and sing fake opera. I don't know. Or maybe I won't. Because I've been reading about centering prayer. It's a particular kind of silence particular practice where you just keep going back to emptying all the fake opera and the good jokes and the stuff that sneaks into your mind. You just keep going back into presence. And then all these things come by, these thoughts and the urge to sing fake opera and you just let it go. And apparently, apparently, you don't have to even be really good at it, but just the intention of going back into presence without distracting thoughts. Apparently, just that intention creates the ability for something that Cynthia Bourgeau, who writes about this, calls divine psychotherapy. And stuff that I didn't think I would still be struggling with when I was in my 60s, if you had asked me 20 or 30 years ago. That stuff somehow just begins to shift. And you don't even have to be good at the silence. It's just being willing to do it. So I guess there's a part of me that was willing to put down the money and sign up and get it paid and say, I'm going on a silent retreat. Nine days, nine days, nine days, nine days. And take a deep breath and let it out. Ah. And we'll put some notes in the chat box. Hmm. Would you like to read those, Ruba? Yes. 
Karen Austin said, I probably should have thought about it. I love that you just, you didn't and just followed the energy, especially if your little brother can do anything. Nine days, nine days, nine days, a moment in time completed with intention. Randy said, oh, the things our brothers get us to do <laughs> one way or another. I can feel calmer just imagining the nine days. Phil said, words and silence. Nine days sounds like a really long time to be silent. If you sing fake opera in the forest, I won't tell. Thank you, Phil. Karen in Australia said, what a delight. Love the friendly competition with your bros. Love Cynthia B. Bourgeau too. Sounds like you'll be good for nine days, just not 10. <laughs> Mary Ellen, I like the thoughts that are in my head, that quote, wishing you the best at this retreat, Ruba. I think you can trust your body wisdom around this. It said yes. Thank you. And uh, Elizabeth said, uh, big sister, big body story, and the nine-day silent retreat, singing and the letting go of it all. Shelly said, sibling rivalry. Did your parents manipulate that instinct siblings have as I did as a parent? Wow. <laughs> That's good. Thank you, Rupa. Okay, that's everybody. So again, I want to thank all of you who came to watch the live stream. Um, the video will be posted on the channel so you can uh, see them later. Also, there are just a, a bunch of other videos there as well. The ones that we did in October, as well as individual stories that we recorded in some of the big body story classes. So if you um, subscribe to the channel, you can see all the ones that are there and hope you'll enjoy those. And I hope you'll come back in February or March. So again, thank you very much. Thank you to all of our storytellers. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen, for helping with the tech stuff.